Well, welcome in. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are recording this event, so um, please uh, be aware of that. And we'll be posting that to both the Ethics Club and Operations and Supply Chain Club's websites um, and distributing it that, that far. Um, but we have a really exciting panel today that's going to be moderated by my friend Derek Dayton here. Um, we have Daniela Polson and Annie Ag Ag Agle, sorry, um, that are going to be talking to us about ethics in the supply chain, um, and we're super excited about that. So I'm going to turn the time over to Derek Dayton, um, and he's going to be introducing our panelists and uh, be facilitating the conversation thus far. Thanks, Jackson. I'm uh, really excited to, to have you guys all here today. Um, like Jackson mentioned, um, we're going to be just diving into supply chain ethics and, and what that really means um, uh, with two companies here. We're talking about uh, Codefaxi and Trigger Grills. So uh, we're really excited to be hosting um, Annie Agle, who is uh, currently serves as the director of a brand and impact at Codefaxi, um, and Daniela, uh, who goes by Danny uh, Polson, uh, who's a supply planner at Trigger Grills, um, and also a current MBA candidate here at the Eccles School. So um, Again, really grateful for your, both of your guys' time, um, and we're excited to dive into this. Um, but let's get into it. So just kind of right off the bat, um, in our, uh, our program in supply chain, uh, when we really think about supply chain ethics, um, a lot of the key aspects that we uh, discuss or revolve around things like responsible sourcing, um, so both ethical and, and sustainable um, responsible labor and, and working conditions, um, and maybe this kind of new trend of supply chain transparency. Uh, I'm just curious, what what do you, would you guys say really defines um, an ethical supply chain? I think that's a hard thing to define because I think ethics and sustainability means a lot of different things to different people. And the first thing is that each company really needs to define it. I'd also say that it's an under-regulated area, which means that there are many, many different approaches to it. I think that's changing. There's a lot of regulation coming down the pipeline. We're already seeing that with SEC and say the US ban on Boohoo, a fast fashion company is no longer um, allowed to import to the US currently. And there are certainly a lot of regulations in the European Union, especially in France and the UK. Um, and so it is becoming increasingly regulated, but who defines ethics that's really up to companies right now. And it really depends on your vertical. Um, and so for example, Cotopaxi is really in the textile apparel space. And so the textile apparel space is notorious for having human rights and labor abuses within the um, massive supply chain. And this affects most supply chain. There are over 130 million people that the International Labor Organization um, suggests are experiencing human rights or labor abuses within global supply chains. So it's one of the largest unaddressed humanitarian crises of our time. That's a third of the population of the United States, just to kind of put it in perspective, right? Um, and so there's, there's some massive issues in supply chains. Um, and then there's also the environmental component. And that's particularly important to think that typically um, every product's biggest carbon footprint occurs within the supply chain. This is especially true of textile and apparel. 90% of your um, carbon footprint occurs before the garment is cut and sewed. So how are the raw materials being made? Are they synthetic fibers, which means they're petrochemicals coming from fossil fuels? Are they cotton? It takes 50,000 liters of water to grow um, the cotton needed to make a single conventional cotton t-shirt. So a lot of those impacts occur in the supply chain and in developing countries, which is also a matter of um, environmental and social justice. So ethical supply chain means that you're really considering all of those factors and that you're doing a good job addressing what you can address while also conveying the limitations of your ability to address certain issues. So that's what an ethical supply chain means to me. And you have to take into consideration what I'm saying, those environmental impacts, your industry, um, where those abuses are likely to be occurring, et cetera. If I could piggyback on what Annie said, I would say that 
uh, if we're thinking about sustainable supply chain, uh, in my view, we're thinking about three main uh, spheres, right? The social, the ethical, and the environmental, right? We cannot, uh, we can, th those would be the, the core um, the core topics that we wanna that we wanna talk now. In practice, though, we have that we we've seen and I've seen in my experience that we have trouble in all those right. From the social standpoint, Annie mentioned it. We uh, in in less developed countries uh, in Asia and South America, Central America, we see um, uh, labor issues right. Kids being exploited to work. Um, very many hours in, in not very good conditions, right? So, so that's a problem on, on the social aspect, the ethical aspect, which is, um, you know, companies um, down the road, you know, down in the, in the supply chain, tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers. And as far as, as, far as you know, farther away we, we, we are in the supply chain, then we find that they may not report their numbers correctly or accurately. Uh, which um, it's a problem, right? And and we we can only so we can only do so much at that point that far in this that far down in the supply chain, and then environmentally, um, my goodness, like what Annie mentioned that the waste that we observe in supply chains many times we 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 may get a garment right or a final product and we are only thinking on how to dispose that product and what that waste means, but in reality the most waste, the, 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 you know, the most dangerous waste perhaps uh, happened way before that product became a finished good, right? And so in supply chain, I think that many times um, out, outside in other industries, we may think that it's the final product, right? It's the final vendor, it's the final finished good, when in reality, it's just like all this other things before that product became a finished good. Um, so I think um, it's a great opportunity for companies, uh, governments, countries, communities, um, every, everybody really to think through um, their supply chain um, and go back you know, as many tiers as they can or as they should to evaluate and see what impact in these three spheres that I'm talking about. Um, what's the impact that they have, that their product has, that their policies have, right, in, in this and, and address that, right? The, the bad thing is that Annie mentioned is that it's not highly regulated and that creates a pain point for everyone um, that, you know, in our industry, we're, we're trying to do things right, but we don't have this legal framework that will back us up, right, when trying to push for really good policies in actions in, uh, you know, really, really good, uh, in good stand with, with our product, with our supply chain, with the communities that the supply chain is impacted by and, and all that. So um, I think um, short, short answer, it's very complicated, but there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity to make a big impact and really think through this critical aspect in supply chain and, and how we can make it sustainable. Yeah, thank you. Those were really helpful. Um, I, I think that Anna really, you know, focusing on defining it at the company level, I think is a great point because um, both of you mentioned how complicated it is really to know, um, you know, how is that really defined um, at, at a large scale is, is hard to really pinpoint. And so I think really emphasizing, you know, here are our company values and here is why, you know, these ethics are uh, a part of our supply chain and, and things like that. So uh, that's a great point. Um, Danny mentioned something that I wanted to dive a little bit further into, uh, and it's really focused on kind of um, suppliers as a whole. And, and so uh, the next question that I have is, um, it's been said that the really the golden rule of supply chain ethics is uh, ultimately know your suppliers. Um, how do you think this helps companies really mitigate um, ethics issues that, that may arise? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I'm especially passionate about this question because I am I, I hold my suppliers uh, very uh, very dear to my heart. <laughs> I'd say uh, I I worked for Cotopaxi for about three years, and all of those three years I was in supply chain. In fact, I was working with Annie very closely in um, 
in, in you know, evaluating our suppliers and making sure that they have uh, good practices um, in the way they treat their employees, as well as uh, how they, they build up our products and source the raw materials and, and all the, those practices during manufacturing. Um, and one thing that I, I could take away from uh, dealing with the suppliers on a daily basis, uh, because um, yes, they're in China, Vietnam, in all of this South America, Central America, and all these places across the world, uh, but when we are when we are able to establish a relationship that it's so close, um, we are also able to develop accountability between each other. Um, and uh, something that something that helped me a lot in, in like building that accountability and trust with our supplier is that I always had in the back of my mind that. Um, they are not a money maker, a, a, a money machine, right? They are not, um, uh, it, it's not another asset. Yes, it's an asset, but it's not a, a machine of our supply chain, right? It's actually a person. It's actually a community. It's actually a family behind that, that name of a vendor that I deal with on a daily basis. And um, I was, uh, I had the opportunity to become very close to my vendors, of course, very professionally and ethically, uh, but also treat them as friends so much so that uh, when they would encounter problems in our production, um, I was I was their partner to resolve and find solutions for that problem. And similarly, many times I encounter problem problems uh, on our side of the supply chain, right? Like after the products have left the factory and many times I encounter problems on this side and I was able to lean on them uh, to, to help me uh, solve and, and find solutions uh, for those problems. Um, and I saw that, um, you know, the language never became a, 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 a barrier at that point, right? Like uh, China, yes, uh, you know, China and Asia, they have other cultures, other language, other ways to treat people. But um, when we became, when I, when I was able to have this relationship as the human relationship that it is, as the friends, relationship, colleagues, partners, uh, relationship that it is, instead of, um, you know, perhaps the, the moneymaker relationship, um, then I, I was able to understand and, and really apply, really, uh, take away really good relationships from, from my vendors and, and my suppliers and how to treat them, how, you know, ethically treat them and, and make sure that within their practices, they can also, they can also um, I guess, have that positive impression from, from us as a client. Yeah, I think that's so well said, Danny. I think it's really important to keep the humanity when you're talking about your supply chains, not just referring to them as vendors. I love that. I think it's actually really critical to performance. A lot of times there's this, historically there's been a very much a top down approach to sustainable supply chain management where, you know, customers in developing con developed countries are sort of dictating how brands should be doing this. And so brands just dictate terms to suppliers without really putting themselves in the supplier shoes or sort of discounting the fact that those suppliers might be every bit as invested, if not more so, in social well-being of environmental protection. That a lot of those impacts are felt most acutely in the factories, not here, not by our consumers. Um, and consumers want the kind of guarantee that they're purchases are not supporting, you know, human rights abuses or social dynamics that they wouldn't agree to as citizens. Um, but at the same time, most factory workers don't want to underpay their workers. Most factory workers don't want to be poisoning rivers and waters in the communities in which they themselves live, that they have the cultural legitimacy and localist mindset that's needed to really understand the true impacts of those negative um, outcomes that are occurring within the supply chain. 
And so coming together and saying, hey, we realize this is not just your problem. And so at Cotopaxi, you know, we do things like financially contribute to all audits. We don't think that our factories should having to be drawing out of their budget to audit. We think that that needs to be a cost sharing exercise. And we help with remediation plans. We don't just expect our suppliers to do that alone. And we don't shoot for perfection. We shoot for continuous progress. You know, factories themselves are like micro society. So are companies. You're never going to get to that point where you have a perfect or sustainable supply chain. That just doesn't exist. Every day you strive to be a little bit more ethical, a little bit more sustainable. And that's a partnership activity and it requires mutual accountability. And I love what Danny said about suppliers communicating when pressures are resulting in negative outcomes. And one area that very few companies look at is their purchasing practices and the way those can impact factory workers or suppliers, right? When you want a really quick turnaround, when you want a massive margin, when you want to change a product quantity or its delivery time, that almost always results in additional worker overtime. That can absolutely result in subcontracting when a factory will tap another factory who you've never met or audited to help meet your product fulfillment. And so it's really important that the companies have that shared sense of accountability and that they're not just dictating terms and expecting suppliers to uphold them. Um, and that it, the collaboration piece is really critical. It's also part of building through everyday action that kind of diverse and inclusive society that we want capitalism to help support. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, one thing that just really stuck out to me there is, um, Annie, you mentioned, you know, just getting a little bit better um, every single time, a little bit more ethical. Um, and it's something that we just focus on so much in supply chain is, is continuous improvement at every level. And so it's really interesting to see how that directly ties into ethics. You know, just a little bit better every time is um, I think a, a really good point. So um, I, 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 I really love that. Um, something that I, I was also kind of mentioned is uh, just consumers in general. Um, uh, consumers, or I guess what I wanted to um, go into is kind of like consumer, um, let's see, sorry, consumer preferences. And so uh, I'm curious over the course of maybe your careers or even at your times at, at your respective companies, um, how have you really seen consumers preferences change um, with regard directly to ethics? I mean, we know millennials and Gen Z care about these issues. We know they're aware of these issues. Um, I will say that it is important for companies to educate though, like the, where the consumer attention lies might not be where the biggest impacts are. And so I also feel like Cotopaxi, we have a marketing kind of goal of making every piece of marketing that we send out a little bit educational. So there's, there is some kind of element of service in that. And so one area of education that we really try to provide to consumers is, yes, plastic packaging matters, but if you look at a company's carbon footprint or a product's carbon footprint, typically that is less than 1% of any product's carbon footprint, and it's less than 1% as part of a company's footprint typically. And so, you know, making sure that they're kind of focused on Actually, what you should be focusing on in the textile apparel is like Danny was saying, those really upstream. So, you know, what are the conditions on the cotton farms? Um, what are the conditions? Where are those recycled petrochemical fabrics coming from? Um, you know, how, how is this company thinking about material selection? Um, how are they supporting suppliers to minimize their waste management? Um, 
But I would say, you know, absolutely, customers are fueling this and it's becoming financially material, which is fantastic. You know, Boohoo is a great example of this for, for folks in the supply chain sector who are not familiar with this. Boohoo is one of the largest fast fashion companies in the world. In America, they own Nasty Gal, if you're familiar with that brand. And the UK discovered slave labor, uh, slave labor within their Leicester factory within England. Um, and it wiped 50% of their company valuation off of the stock index. And so these things are becoming financially relevant and increasingly regulated. And so that's a huge benefit to people like me and Danny who are having to justify smaller margins, who are having to justify longer lead times, and maybe these ethical supplier dynamics that might incur short-term losses, even if they promote long-term success. And so customers are allies. I would also say though, that there's a, there's a needed opportunity for brands to not just buy in and chase that desire, but also help shape it through additional information that's helping to educate those consumers, not just about why you're a good brand, but how they should care effectively to drive that change as customers. I think what Annie said in like making sure that the, the customers have direct, uh, we bring the customer's attention to this, um, you know, to, to, to what, what the product means and what impact it had in the supply chain. It's very important. It's critical. It's really critical to make them our allies. And in a recent survey, I read that um, overall, uh, the customers, a uh, very high percentage of customers will care about these issues, right? Will we'll care about uh, how the supply, how the product is sourced, how it's built, how it's made, how it's shipped. Uh, and in general, they will care about that. However, when they were, when the same customers were asked if they look at the labels or if they look at the the right the the, the footprint, right the, the small the small uh, the small letters in a product, uh, many of them answer that they don't. Right, while they care about these issues, they don't specifically look at the product and 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 try to find. Okay, how was this sourced? When this was sourced? In which condition was it sourced? And that to me means that the information is not easily available to them. And if it's available, it's like in this fine print at the end of the bottle of whichever product they're buying, right? And that is a problem. Uh, because if we wanna, like Annie mentioned, if we wanna have them as allies, we wanna also give them the, the information to to, for, for them to, to keep us accountable, right? To keep our supply chain, um, making sure that our supply chain is what we claim it is, even in that fine print, right? So um, I think that it's very important that we, like Annie said, that we educate our customers and that we make this reports or metrics or um, evaluations, results of evaluations, everything available to the community, available to our customers. And in that sense, I think that Cotopaxi has done um, a great job. In fact, um, I believe it was last week when Annie and Cotopaxi um, uh, posted the impact report for last year, right? And it was, it was, uh, my hats off to, to Annie and, and her effort on, on this, it was amazing. Um, and efforts like those are needed by, you know, I, I are just, it's imperative that the companies that really wanna create this impact and make their customers aware of, of all of the issues and, and the supply chain and how the companies are trying to address those issues then it's imperative that these metrics and reports and evaluations results, everything becomes available, right? Because that creates also accountability between the customer and the, and the, um, uh, and the company um, and really the supply chain that the company operates. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love the fact of, of really educating consumers and, and customers about where their product is coming from, what kind of impact that's making and and Danny, I, I feel for you too, and, and a great work with the 
Uh, I love reading those impact reports, especially with a, a company like Cotopaxi. It's it's really interesting, and and we've seen this over the last you know several years. And um, you know, still in, still in my undergrad, and I haven't been alive that long. But even that being said, um, the the social or just the reports that we see, both environmental and social, and 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 all those kind of reports that have been starting to uh, be released every year from even bigger companies and um, it's just really interesting to see that what kind of impact um, each of these companies are having. And, and something that I wanted to touch on um, uh, real quick really ties into more of the transparency side. And so I'm just going to share this real quick with you guys so you can see, but, um, and then I'll um, talk about it. But uh, these are two like traceability and, and manufacturing maps that, um, that we've seen from brands that are, that are alive right now. So, um, if anybody is interested, um, these are just like through uh, Nike's manufacturing map um, and VF Corporation, which uh, owns some of the big brands like North Face and Timberland um, and Vans and, and a bunch of other brands. But um, these, uh, and I, I noticed these over the past um, maybe year or so. Um, and so it's a really different kind of transparency, being able to see where these finished goods are coming from, what is happening throughout the supply chain. Um, I guess my main question really comes down to uh, what are the advantages or, or disadvantages to, to transparency really at this level? All right, I'll go, Denny. <laughs> um, so I would say, uh, first of all, I, I think this is pro forma at this point. You know, we have something very similar at Cotopaxi to. Um, you need to know your entire value chain. Um, and that's really critical for, for many reasons. For those ethical reasons, it also ties in very strongly to quality and assurance, Q&A. Um, because if you don't know where your materials are coming from, the conditions that they're built under, you really can't be assured of the quality. And so I think more and more companies are doing this. The other thing that's allowing this, I'm actually pretty sure that both of the information for this is actually pulled from a third party called Source Map. I'm not 100% sure, but there are so many new mapping and traceability tools out there for companies to use. And obviously blockchain is also a very exciting technology. And as supply chains have become multi-tiered, um, where you have a raw material, you might have a mill, several intermediaries, your finished goods stop, your logistics and shipping, um, you know, all of that. And that's not even post-consumer and thinking about post-consumer waste management or in that supply chain, right? And so, you know, it's increasingly important to map it. You can't make informed decisions if you're not mapping. I think what these things don't show though is intermediaries. It doesn't show subcontracting. I do think that my issue with some of these is it really convinces the consumer that this is more set and locked than it is. And the reality is supply chains, as all of you know from studying them, are incredibly complicated and they're messy, they're dynamic, it changes every day. We're living in a very um, volatile and uncertain environment, especially post COVID. And so it's not set in stone. And I, I always like to say, we try to be very upfront with Cotopaxi and in that impact report, we did not just share positive findings. You know, we shared negative findings. And frankly, if you're a VF corporation or a Nike, there is no way you do not have labor issues that are actively occurring in your supply chain period. Um, there's no way you don't have human rights abuses. And our approach at Cotopaxi is we just assume these things are happening and we don't try to present to the customer this level of certainty that this is exactly the path a garment took because there's only so much as a brand we can do to determine and verify that. And so while it's really important to show the traceability work and where you are and to the extent that you can educate consumers on the complexity and the journey that their product take, um, takes, it's also really important, I think, to convey the limits of your sphere of influence as a brand 
and the limits of your ability to successfully tackle these issues. And that's where it comes back to regulation and nation states. It's really important to understand that only nation states can confer and maintain human rights. Brands are not in a position to do that legally or politically. And so I think it's really important that brands advocate for policies around this and recognize their shortcomings and also just admitting the conflict of interest. There is an inherent conflict of interest. If you are in the product market, you need margins. And so the higher your margin, the more profits you're gonna make, the more successful you are. And that also means at some level, it's not exactly a sum zero system, but in some cases it is. That means that workers in developing countries are getting paid less. And that is an inherent conflict of interest. And so I think there is work to be done and while I think these exercises and manifestations of traceability are generally a step in the right direction, I also think that they need to do a better job conveying what cannot be known or proven or verified. I'd say wonderfully said, Annie, and I agree with everything really that Annie said, and I would like to emphasize mostly one aspect, which is that um, everything, uh, you know, everyone that has worked in supply chain knows uh, that it changes so much and so quickly every, every day, if not, you know, every hour. And it's simply because that's the dynamic of the industry. Um, that's how demand and supply works and uh, supply chain just reacts to this, um, to this, um, to this dynamic. Uh, and one example, one easy example, and if you are in supply chain, you probably heard already about the, the Seuss Canal, right? And this, uh, this huge boat being stuck over there and, and really creating um, all of this, this bottleneck, this huge bottleneck. And we, are, uh, we have factories in a trigger, we have factories in that part of the world, but really our trade line lanes are um, mostly in the Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean, right? Um, and even then, even being that far away from uh, the Seuss Canal and having most of our trade lanes in the Pacific, we are hugely impacted by this event, terribly impacted. So much so that uh, we are changing most, most purchase orders that we have right now, more, most lead times that we have right now. Um, our sourcing teams are looking for new vendors, you know, outside of our normal, um, of our normal business right now, right? Like simply because this creates a, a huge impact, right? And so uh, by saying with this example, I just wanna stress how dynamic the industry is in general. It's, it's by default, it changes every day, every hour, every minute, simply because that's, that's the nature of the industry. And sometimes we are, we may, uh, we may just get stuck in like beautiful visuals, right? Or, or maybe metrics are showing um, one, one part of the business only that perhaps down the road it changed or it will change. Um, and, and we need to continuously have to update that, right? And so uh, my, uh, I guess my point to this one is that, uh, Sometimes we, we just want to, many, I'd say always, we just want to be aware of that constant change that's happening in the supply chain that can, you know, can just reshuffle our whole world in supply chain, including uh, many of the things that we've talked about today, right? Like where our product is coming from, how it's been sourced, our trade lanes, our everything, and within that, our impact, right? And he said it's we can easily change um, to a new vendor that we didn't, we haven't audited, but we need it, right? But we don't know how that vendor um, is sourcing the raw materials or how much uh, the vendor is paying the workers or maybe what kind of workers they are hiring, right? Uh, but because of this changes in the supply chain or in the industry really, then we are forced to take this um, shortcuts sometimes, I would call it shortcuts that will um, create this huge impact in our supply chain, right? 
Um, so I'll finish with that, but um, that would be my, my point, the point that I want to stress. We want to make sure that we, we acknowledge how, how dynamic our industry is. Yeah, thank you. That's, it's really a great point, both of you emphasizing just, just the dynamic nature of supply chain. And, and oftentimes it's so much harder to visualize it than you might um, anticipate that it could be. Um, and, and I think, Danny, it really is easy to, you know, get overwhelmed with visuals and, and think that it's, you know, uh, really showing you what's going on. But um, at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of things that go into it and, it, and it's not as easy as we might think, uh, just at the either at the consumer level and um, even in the supply chain, um, it, it can often be more complicated than you think. Um, one question that I want to dive into, um, and kind of the last question before we go to the attendee uh, Q&A, because I want to make sure we have time for those. Um, but uh, Annie did start to mention kind of the, the disruption of, of COVID. Um, I'm maybe just curious in terms of when significant uh, interruptions occur, um, such as COVID or, or even the Swiss Canal, um, how does this affect the, the priority of supply chain um, ethics in organizations? Okay, so I'll, I'll go there first. Um, I would say, uh, if there is, um, you know, with COVID and really with any other with any other um, impact that we have, what I've seen in my experience is that in, in essence, in practice, what it does is like, um, it almost sort of like breaks our, our connection, right? So we have a connection, call it with uh, a vendor or a factory in China. And when some of this happens, it breaks it completely. Like it stops, we stopped communicating. And a great example is when COVID happened last year, um, it was uh, right during the period when one of our factories was uh, in Lunar New Year. So we, we already have not had communication with them uh, for you know, a week or so. Um, but then when COVID hit, it, the communication was cut 100% in a way that we didn't like in, in my function, I did not hear, I did not get any email from my vendor um, or from um, my carrier over there in China um, or from really any other, any other partner that I would have. And I also found that some of my colleagues in the industry also did not have any communication as far as like real answers of what's going on, right? Real expectations like, um, if you are a shutdown, if you're shutting down the factory, let me know, right? And that communication didn't flow as it would normally do in, in, in other cases. So I, I found that um, it, it basically creates that cut, right? 100% cut. Perhaps in, uh, in other um, parts of the supply chain is not as drastic, but, but what I've seen is that um, in my experience, it, it's become, it's, it's been like 100%. Now, what that, what that generates? Uh, on, my, on our side, uh, the first thing that it generates is the stress, right? What's going on? The uncertainty. What's going on? Uh, why are we not getting answers? What happened with our product? What happened with our investment? What happened with our trade lanes? Did they, did they shut down? Are they, are just, do we still have vessels? Do we still have airplanes? Do we still have airports operating to bring our product in? And if yes, do we still have customers, right? It creates this, like, uh, it... Um, it's like a chain of events that down the road will, will create this uncertainty and, and stress. And so that uh, sometimes I think that because of that stress, then we, uh, we, it creates reactions, right? Reactions in making decisions, um, in uh, adjusting timelines, um, in adjusting um, even communication, right? Like what Annie mentioned is that we may not we may not get timely answers. Okay, what's plan B right away, right? What's plan B? And while that's a good practice in terms of risk management and, and how, to, how to handle that risk at that point, um, I think it exacerbates the supply chain down the road, right? Um, I heard that uh, in, in many, in, in our factories back when, when COVID hit, uh, many of the workers did not come back 
um, for many weeks, really, to the factories. And rightly so, right? Many of, the, of these places were in quarantine, so um, they, they couldn't come back. Um, but I think that uh, many of the decisions that we will make out of this perhaps stress or additional stress that we see in the supply chain uh, will exacerbate even more um, at the vendor level, right? And down the road, tier two level, tier three levels, carriers in between, brokers in between, um, um, investors in between, right? Like it will exacerbate that. Um, so I don't think I, I have a good answer on like the ideal way to handle that, uh, that stress and how those events will, will cause that stress. I will mostly say that um, it, it takes a lot of responsibility um, from you know from from this side of the of of the supply chain, let's say, to handle those risks, right? To handle uh, to be prepared to handle those risks. And uh, what I've uh, what it, it's worked for me is that uh, having that partnership, as I mentioned, with the vendor and with your supply chain partners, makes a huge difference when an event like this happens in your supply chain. It's it's day and night what you what you can come out of um, how you can come out of that situation really in terms of um, solving the issues or perhaps um, you know finding finding those solutions that that will allow you to get over the the stress or the challenge or uh, really uh, you know the the risk that they've been discussing. Yeah, I don't feel that I have that much to add from what Don Danny said, but I think the first thing to understand is that COVID disproportionately impacted worker communities, right? Um, it exposed workers to loss of income, which then exposes them to greater risk of human trafficking, debt bondage, um, all, all manner of uh, sort of potential criminal activity and exploitative practices. And so I think that's the first thing to consider is when you're experiencing disruptions as a company or there are these global kind of black swan events or climate disasters, understanding that before it's gonna hit your bottom line, it hits a real person's life. And taking that into consideration and having that human conversation, like Danny is saying with a supplier and showing concern and showing that you understand and are willing to share that burden. And even if there are short term expenses associated with that, for example, at Cotopaxi, you know, we did have to make adjustments to orders. Um, and we were, I, I stepped in as an impact officer and said, listen, we want to make sure that none of the workers on our line experience financial layoffs during this time. We will cover the difference for their salaries um, during this period, even if they're not making orders. And in the long run, there's a lot of double blind economic studies that show the factory workers know that they will work and dedicate their time to the quality on your products. They know your brand name. Um, and, you know, that's why our return rate at Cotopaxi is so good. And that's, you know, one of the biggest red lines in a lot of companies' portfolios, right? Um, I think the other thing to pay attention to is good partnerships and relationships and ethics build resilient supply chains. It allows you to work with a partner to solve problems around unprecedented events. You know, whether it's changing the frequency of orders, whether it's staggering some of your product launches, whether it's working with them to find some alternatives, or whether it's working with them to help identify potential partners and other facilities. And so when you're kind of combating it that way, and there's this sense of just not coming in with demands and dictums, but coming in there as an equal partner who understands the issues that they're going through or understands um, and understands that this is disproportionately impacting their workers, then you can have a really effective conversation around how to work around these issues. And that's what builds a strong and ethical supply chain is when everyone is allowed to come to the table and sees that not just as a, a kind of mandate, 
but as a strategy, you know, ethical strategy as a problem solving tool, not just a set of rules and regulations that, you know, factories have to kind of passively follow. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love both of those points. Um, I think that really just now what you were mentioning, Annie, in terms of having given those uh, workers, even um, in the suppliers, just a seat at the table in terms of this conversation has a huge impact in terms of building that resilience on the long term. And it's really interesting to see, um, even just from your experience, um, a lot of those effects of COVID are way more significant than we might see just at the just at the front level. And so um, I, I like Danny and Annie both. Thank you for those, um, those thoughts on that topic. Um, I did want to, like I said, get to the, uh, some of the Q&A in the chat so that we answer some of those. Um, and so one that we have here is um, when looking at a business opportunity, how do you determine whether the environmental and social costs are worth the opportunity that you are pursuing? I love this question and I'm the first to admit there is no barrier to entry in terms of driving corporate social responsibility. And I would hope that any student, wherever you go, you're gonna push your company in the direction of constant improvement. I would also say that I love speaking to students in this field because I honestly think you're our next generation of heroes. To me, this is like the most critical vertical that any student could be studying right now if they want to have a positive impact. I truly believe that. Um, and in everything that I do, you know, from corporate philanthropy to all manner of different aspects of CSR, I would say that sustainable and ethical supply chain management is what I consider to be the single biggest priority of mine because of the opportunity to mitigate your negative impacts and amplify your positive impacts. And I would say every company needs it. If they don't know they need it, that means that they need you all the more. And so I guarantee you, you know, it's, you will generate value, value for that company, value for yourself, and most importantly, value for society and our planet. So I would say, you know, bring that sense of conviction and determination wherever you go. And I would also say, use every opportunity. If someone's talking down to you and not giving you the time of day, think about how you can present this in a way that's material to them. And I would say there's so many double blind studies now that illustrate, you know, in cold, hard quant numbers, the financial materiality of having ethical supply chain management. And you know, the, the low end pitch is always, yes, there are going to be short-term expenses, but there is long-term success. And without that ethical investment, you are not going to have longevity as a brand anymore. And this is becoming regulated. And so, you know, that's your speech when you go in, if you're working for a company that's having a hard time. And I would always say, you know, there's always gonna be people in your network, whether it's someone like Danny or myself or other students who can help you make that case. Um, don't give up if that struggle is there. You know, I would say like at Cotopaxi, do we have this all figured out? No, absolutely not. But we're really focused and dedicated on it. I would rather see conscientious students like you all going to places that might not know this. And I would say that doesn't mean they're bad companies, right? The, this kind of weird moral, um, you know, binaryism of good and bad companies, good and bad political parties, et cetera. It's not very useful to true ESG work. And I would say, you know, the biggest body of companies that aren't doing this are business to business, small to medium sized enterprises. And usually they're not doing it because they don't know about it and none of their customers are asking about it and they don't have the resources or the cash flow to help with it. And it's a tremendous opportunity. And I would say, if you really care about that industry, but also wanna make yourself really valuable, that's the kind of company I would go after are those small to medium-sized enterprises. That's 90% of, of most nations' companies are small to medium. And those are the ones that are being left out. Multinational enterprises have whole teams for this. You know, and the people who have demonstrated that they know how to do this, this isn't who needs help, right? 
Um, and so I would say in some ways, like I would go after companies you don't think have a real grasp on this situation and demonstrate your knowledge and willingness to gain experience and help lead the way forward for them. Well, I really don't have any anything um, to add to that except for um, I love what Annie said about small companies, right? Mainly because um, I, I, what I've observed is that there is a lot of opportunity for for you or anyone really that wanna that wanna poke around in this in this sustainable um, topic. Um, I, I would say that the most opportunity you can find is in these small companies because they do not have it figured out. So Annie said, this big multinationals that want to save, um, you know, entire regions of the world of the rainforest or, or whatever, or whatever, which is valid, yes, right? But um, they have an entire team of, of people uh, doing this, right? Investing in this. And my hat, my hat, you know, my hat off to these companies because they are doing the right thing. But I think there is a lot of opportunity in these smaller companies that don't have it figured out. And really, uh, when Annie and, and I, Annie and I joined Cotopaxi, I think Cotopaxi we we found it in this like very baby stage as far as impact and sustainability in the supply chain. <clears throat> And Annie uh, has done a tremendous job from there, right? To, to take the whole program and just have it, take it to the next level. And it's been Annie and Annie and Annie. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful- That's true, girl, team effort. <laughs> Couldn't have done it without you. It, thank you. It's, uh, what, I, what I'm saying is that there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity in small companies. And on top of that, the cherry on top of that would be that um, these companies really need it, right? Because these are, um, you know, the, the mom and pops shops, right? These smaller community companies that really have, um, uh, you know, so, sort of like really understand um, the need, right? Uh, because there are many of them are, um, started and launched by students like you guys or very young professionals like me or um, you know people that really want to have a, have an impact in this in this space um, so that's the only thing that I would add to that uh, Annie it's it's amazing to you know to hear all the all the advice that you give all of us really here so that's all I can say I got you Danny Danny and I are kind of fond of each other and we both think we're like <laughs> you know, she's, she's, she's the best. <laughs> and he's the best. <laughs> Thank you guys. That I, I really love the focus on just impact as a whole. And, and that's what really um, drove me and, and really <laughs> makes me interested in this whole supply chain um, ethics and what kind of impact that can have, because it's, again, it's just way bigger than you think it can be. Um, and so it makes me really excited for uh, a future going into supply chain and, and hopefully many other students here uh, will also have that opportunity to um, be excited as well. Um, but I did want to um, turn the time back over to Jackson just to kind of close things out. Um, again, um, Annie, Danny, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy days to, to meet with us and, and um, give us some of your insights on this topic. We do really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for joining and thanks for focusing in this field and putting on these webinars. It, it really, um, I don't know, it's what gets me up in the morning. It's what gives me hope. You guys truly are like a force to be reckoned with and don't give up. You, what you're doing matters. It really does. Likewise here. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, I'm very excited and very passionate about topics like this and um, Really, any time that you guys want to chat, uh, you can find us uh, on LinkedIn. We'll, we'll op always be open to have a conversation that will hopefully spark some ideas into how we can how we can think through these issues and and try to you know find find a conversation how to address those how to how to solve them even. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Danny and Annie, and uh, shout out Derek, who was a, a killer moderator during this uh, this event. Um, I'm going to throw up the uh, QR code for the Business Scholars Passport points. So if that applies to you, um, then stay on and look out for that. 
Um, otherwise, thank you again for joining us today. And then again, thank you so much, Danny and Annie, um, for you know hosting such a great panel. So thank you all. Okay. And hopefully y'all can see that. Um, just send me a message if you can't. And I'll stay on for a few more minutes just so you can scan that QR code if you need it. All right, y'all, I'm gonna take this down. If uh, you still need this QR code, just feel free to send me an email. Um, I can throw that in the chat. Otherwise, thank you again for joining us today. Yeah, we're good. I don't even need it from my email. Sweet, Derek. Well done, my friend. Cool. Um, do you have the recording on your end? Do you want to? Um, yeah, do let I me control that or.